Hello? Ah, did you turn it off? Hey. How's everyone? All good? Tired? Um, so today I'm going to share some experiences from virtual reality with you, so hopefully some of this will be useful. Um, my name's Today. I come from a studio in, based in Maribor, that's 60 kilometers from here, if somebody doesn't know. And um, we, I'm the technical co-founder, also uh, take over the creative side, a lot of the story writing and, and puzzle design and so on. My background actually is in uh, 3D uh, graphical engines and game engines, so, but I, I moved to other stuff later on. Um, currently, our most uh, notable product is Elroy and the Aliens, which is a uh, hand-drawn 2D uh, adventure game, point-and-click adventure game. It's uh, not done yet, but uh, we're working on it. Um, here's some more screenshots from there. And uh, in, or in order to be able to survive, uh, we work on other stuff as well. Uh, we've, we've been around for several years now. and. Um, and we worked with clients uh, all over the world, uh, working on web things from video games to websites to interactive experiences on billboards and stuff like that. And uh, in the recent years, there's been a lot of um, a lot of requests for VR stuff from all over the place. Uh, and uh, that's not the reason why we turned into this direction, but uh, it's something else. A couple of months ago, we got the HTC Vive. And uh, this is actually Giga over there, who helped me work on this presentation as well. Thank you, Giga. And um, uh, when we got it, I mean, we all tried the first Oculus DK1 at first, and uh, Samsung Gear VR and, and stuff like that. But uh, until, we, you know, until we, we've tried this one, we weren't really ready to invest money in it and time. And um, uh, the lady over there said before something, she's done now. So you don't have to look. Uh, <laughs> uh, she said something about bridging gaps and trying to be uh, cross, you know, like uh, to think outside the box and, and mingle with people who are not necessarily game developers. And I think, you know, to whomever I've shown stuff on HTC Vive, they could immediately see the potential of VR and also through that see the potential of video games somehow. I guess most people, believe it or not, don't really understand what video games are all about. So, uh, just a quick question. How many of you have tried the Vive? Awesome. Uh, and Oculus, the newest, new one? Okay. And um, Gear VR? Awesome. How many of you are working on this platform, doing something? How many of you are excited about it and want to do something sometime? Okay. It's fine. We can go for a beer and skip this presentation. Then. <laughs> So just, just a quick look at what the VR landscape looks like. Um, these are questions uh, posted, um, I think, before or after GDC Europe. And they, they, they compare it, you know, what kind of platforms people are, game developers are interested in developing for. So of course, PC and mobile are, are, and com consoles are still, still more prominent than, than VR is. But it's, it's slowly picking up. And HTC Vive this year, it's of course, because it's, it came out officially, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a growing platform and uh, if we compare some of these uh, uh, platforms with each other you know you can see like there are differences in price there are differences in convenience convenience means what do I need to change in my home to be able to use it for instance for the Vive you need to make room you need to set up you know those lasers you need to you need to um, do a little bit more than for instance with PlayStation VR where you just add one thing to your living room if you're already on the net, a PlayStation. <laughs> and, uh, but of course, the quality and immersiveness of the experience varies across these platforms. And uh, if you look, I can, I can speak from the business uh, point of view for a little while now. Uh, and if you look at the demand in the market right now, design agencies right now are looking for mostly stuff for, for Google Cardboard, for Samsung Gear VR, because that's stuff that a lot of people own. And with Daydream, mobile VR is going to be even more. Uh, how many of you know what Daydream is? Okay, it's, it's Google's new platform that will allow um, VR with motion tracking on, on mobile phones, on new ones. And it's, it's uh, promising to kind of expand and standardize a little bit of this space. Uh, it's pretty exciting, but it's still 
still going to be like a couple of steps behind what you can um, do with room scale. Uh, so as I said, design agencies are looking for stuff that has some massive appeal. Of course, mobile VR doesn't have massive appeal like you know Clash of Clans has, but still, it's it's uh, it's it's much more prominent and it's more appropriate for marketing uh, marketing uh, you know campaigns and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, as for immersive experiences, video games, stuff that we are excited about, you know, a sitting or a room scale VR experience is something we 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 would let, we like to go for. And room scale basically means that you can move around the room, you know, you can, you can turn around, you can crouch, you can lie down, you can, you know, hit your head into invisible walls and stuff like that. And you also have, of course, two motion controllers that you can use to, uh, as extensions of your real hands. Um, and um, Valve recently uh, released um, a, a table with, with a couple of stats of how big people's rooms are. Because when you install the Vive, you, you measure the space that you have, and they keep statistics of that. And this, this is hopefully helpful if somebody's working on Vive games, you know, so you know what kind of dimensions um, uh, you have to work with. Uh, usually we like to just think of the bare minimum, because uh, anything further than that is, is, uh, could be problematic. And introduce also design challenges. Um, some people like uh, Alchemy Labs, who w work on Job Simulator, decided to make an experience that's playable both in standing, uh, 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 in a standing fashion, or room scale. So you can move around the room, but the environment around you is small enough so that you can basically reach everything that, that you like. And um, uh, Oculus Touch is coming out this year, I think, hopefully. Uh, and they, um, Oculus went in a little. Oculus was the first with, with this whole new VR revolution stuff. But they picked a different uh, technology and a different approach to track the player. Uh, you can still track with, with two cameras and two motion controllers, the Oculus Touch. You can still track position and, and movement inside the room. But due to the historic, uh, uh, different, historically different approach they took, they talk, often talk about you know, not even being sure if room scale is necessary. I mean, I think it's a great. Uh, I think uh, comparing room scale to just standing there looking at the screen is is uh, is a huge step, but this is a very subje subjective opinion. So, hang on. Yeah. So, as I said a couple of um, maybe two months ago, we started working on on, on something of our own uh, uh, on a on a game that we wanted to to try a lot of ideas that we have uh, had about VR with. Um, and currently, I'm gonna show. I'm gonna sh just show a couple of videos that are very crappy first version stuff, uh, prototype that, that will show some of the mechanics that that that, uh, that we're working on. So just keep in mind the graphics are not final. Uh, the game is basically about you're a child, and this is your room, and at some point you look out of the win out of the window and you see a giant thing there. We'll see it right now. And then it draws you in and it draws you into the, in, an imaginary space. And in this imaginary space, you can do a lot of things. Uh, you can use your hands, you can teleport around, you can interact with the environment normally, uh, but you can also take control of the environment around you. When you take control, the movements that they're doing with their hands are transferred to the objects in your environment. So that might be giant robots floating, uh, swimming through the air. Uh, in this case, you know, we we take the low, we take the uh, movement of the hands and uh, apply it to the to the character itself. And um, in doing so, we know we use inverse kinematics to know where the rest of the uh, arm is. Because in in the Vive, you only know where the hands are. You have to figure out the rest yourself. So. Another example of this is you can stand on a platform, you can use your arms to swing the, to flap the wings on the platform to go further up. There are also giant robots that you can control using your hands. So, for instance, there, 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 there is a puzzle item that you need to get on the other side of the room. You can use your hands to have the robot pick, pick it up and throw it to you. And in this approach, it immediately becomes obvious that HSC Vive 
for, for such an idea is missing one one piece and this is uh, for instance you're tracking you're tracking the head and you're tracking both hands but you're not tracking what the torso is so if I stand like this and move my head like this the system thinks I'm turned around in that direction so um, our next step in development here is approximating the position and the rotation of the torso uh, to use as a, like a reference point for all the other movement and uh, we do that we do that by uh, looking where the, where the hands are and the head is and, and with some uh, um, advanced algorithms and here's here's the, an example of what happens if you don't do that so i turn my head you see that now like when you turn your head the arms turn as well because they think that the whole uh, direction of the object is is changing so there are a couple of um, things in vr that I know there was a whole talk about this uh, before today, so I'm not going to even go into it. But um, locomotion has been a big thing. Like uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of games where you use like things like uh, climbing ladders with your hands or or, or walking by waving around arms uh, and and, uh, and hands. But I think teleportation is still a very promising and and uh, and uh, one of the best ideas out there right now. Uh, um, yeah, give me a second. Uh, I talked before about um, uh, the absence of, of torso tracking and tracking of other parts of the body, but all that's coming. I mean, technology is already out there. You can use other technology to, and combine it with the vibe to, to be able to track everything, like STEM system. But also, Valve's opening up their hardware platform. So, in, in a year's time, at most, I think we should start seeing straps that you can put on, on the rest of your body. And imagine having, having things on your, on your legs and feet so you can like, shoot penalties in football and stuff like that. It's pretty exciting stuff. And of course, leap motion has been around for, for a while now, but now, now they're starting to have something that's, that's really usable uh, when combined with the Vive or Oculus. Uh, so leap motion basically is a system that lets you track individual fingers, which is quite not quite nice. Imagine having this system as a learning tool for teaching people sign language. Uh, then uh, the thing like uh, right now you don't have feedback when you touch stuff in VR. You just move your hand to something and move it through it, but by vibrating or or, or some visual indication, you see that you hit it. Uh, but uh, people are working on that as well. So Dexter Robotics is, is working on gloves that they can use uh, <laughs> to be able to actually feel stuff. Um, yeah, there are a couple of challenges. Uh, I mean, when we started working on this, of course, there are a lot of presentations right now about uh, wh what people are doing, uh, what kind of roadblocks they're facing, but uh, we, we, we see a lot of that ourselves. Like performance, for instance, is a very prominent one. Uh, I know, has any of you been sick in VR? Like, okay, so apart from bad design, which could uh, lead to sickness, uh, it's usually a pr the problem is performance. Like if you don't have a frame rate that's 90 frames per second or, or at least 60, you're gonna get sick. Last time I tried, I tried on my, my home computer, it's not quite as powerful as it should be. I tried one of the, I, th I think it was called the Star Seat. Uh, uh, like an adventure game and I got so sick I was sick for th sick for three hours after playing it for five minutes so my advice if you get sick in VR stop playing it get a better computer or, or change the game you're playing and uh, in order to to keep performance where it should be you, you should know a lot of stuff uh, from graphics programming and, and optimization uh, a lot of this stu stuff has been forgotten in, in the games uh, in the recent years because people just make something like if you make a low poly game and just release it on PC it's usually not a big, huge problem if it's not uh, particularly optimized but in VR you, you have to pay attention to these things um, and uh, another thing is spatial distortion uh, most platforms usually solve this themselves but if you're using if you're working on mobile VR you have to understand what the lenses do and how this affects the rendering like uh, the lenses are in front of your eyes and it's, it's similar to using like a really wide angle or, a, or you know a, a narrow wide angle lens uh, on, a, on a camera 
you get distortion. And distortion you get is a pinch cushion distortion. So in order to circumvent that, you have to apply transformations to the pixels before drawing them. Uh, the systems, uh, the um, intermediary APIs, um, the software that actually uh, renders the VR for you, or, or Unity, or, or, or Unreal, or whatever, you know, they, they use this effect to, to know which pixel the pixels they don't need to draw because they're outside of the visible space after applying the uh, distortion of geometry. But in mobile, um, I have a friend who, who worked on a cardboard project that was pretty graphically heavy, and they used something that they uh, they came up with the trick where they distort the actual geometry first, and then just render. Uh, so, so so they don't you have to rely on on shaders on Android. So here's uh, another example of this same effect. Uh, another pretty important thing I think is uh, normal maps. Uh, all of you know what normal maps are? Yeah. So basically, long story short, you have a high poly model, you use it to, to bake uh, where normals should be facing on each, each pixel on the, each texel on the object. And then you can use a low, low poly version to, um, uh, to display on screen to save uh, time and, and space. Uh, but the problem in VR if, is if you look at uh, something that's normal mapped, that's bump mapped uh, from close up, it doesn't look right because there's no parallax effect. Uh, and uh, you have to take this into account. If you're looking uh, at things inside your, your space, you have to basically change it to geometry, not, not, not use normal mapping. If it's uh, further away, then normal mapping is fine. Uh, then there's um, some other stuff that goes on with things further away. We don't need to go into details here. Uh, one thing that a lot of people are, are hate in, in, in VR is the shimmering effect. When you move your head, it feels like everything's shimmering. That's usually due to aliasing. And because aliasing is different on each of the eyes, you get a shimmering effect. And uh, John Carmack had a <laughs> pretty angry post a couple of uh, maybe weeks ago uh, on Facebook about uh, why th th there's basically no excuse uh, for developers to, to leave that in the game. And basically uh, Elite, I think, uh, has this exact problem. They don't do meat mapping uh, on textures uh, and, and um, uh, that's why they had aliasing on, on a lot of the stuff that generated in-game. Also, there's, uh, you, know, you know, if you're used to, uh, how many of you use Unity? Yes, most. Um, if you use Unity, there's a lot of scripts that you can use, like put on the cameras and, uh, and uh, have uh, camera image effects and stuff like that. And you have to take, it, take into account that now you, ha you have two cameras, basically, like uh, each is a little apart from the other. And you have to, um, you know, some effects will work great still. You can just use it on on both cameras, but some, some effects won't work as great. And there's a, if any of you want this link, I can post it later as well. Um, this is a quick tip how you can test games with uh, super sampling. Like if you pre-render, if you, you have the engine pre-render uh, the game view uh, in a high resolution and then output it to VR, it can look uh, much better. One of the very important and prominent things in VR is uh, user interfaces. And uh, uh, do you know what diegetic means? It's like something that's in the game environment. It's diegetic, non-diegetic UI is uh, like a menu that pops up. And um, diegetic user interface is basically the only thing that works in VR. It's uh, you put buttons and stuff uh, inside your game environment and, and then uh, interact with that. And I think, you know, even Tiltbrush does that quite well. Uh, and I think in, in um, very soon this will be the, the, only, the only way to, to interact with the interfaces in VR. Uh, a thing to, it's quite important that, that Giga pointed out to me a couple of days ago, is affordances. Uh, affordances basically means uh, when you see an object, do you understand what kind of stuff you can do with this object? How you can interact with it? If you see a teapot, because of your previous experience in life, you understand that you can pick this teapot up, you can lift the uh, lid, you can put water in it, and you can pour stuff. Um, 
uh, the doorknob, you can you also understand from your previous experience what you can do with it. And uh, in VR, it's extremely, extremely annoying if you see something where you, uh, that you attribute uh, possible action to, and you can't actually do that. Like, uh, there's uh, the Starseed game I, I mentioned earlier, it's a first person, person uh, um, adventure game. So you go around the environment, you combine items and stuff like that. But then there's a table, and there are a couple of uh, things on it. And some of the things you just can't pick up, <laughs> your hand just goes through them. And it's really, really annoying. So it's uh, the, this is very important for level design, for, for game design in general in VR, that you don't actually do this. Like if, if things are, even, even if things are static and they look like they could, you could pick them up, if it only vibrates when you go through them with your hand, you kind of lose uh, the immersion at that moment. But for development, uh, our own experience is uh, mostly Unity. You have uh, Steam VR for, for other platforms as well. But it's uh, basically room scale VR currently is a PC exclusive experience. Um, and there's a lot, a, lot of, um, a lot of stuff in the Unity store that you can use that's pretty much free and it can help a lot with, uh, with development. Um, another thing is audio. Um, like uh, you only, you have two ears and uh, intuitively you would think that, okay, I just put a, a sound file, you know, like an audio source somewhere in the environment in Unity and I play it and, and uh, it'll work fine. Uh, but it's not the case. Uh, for VR, it's very important to use, uh, use a spatializer uh, because your ears can actually pick up, pick up like slight changes, uh, slight delays in when the sound uh, actually uh, uh, arrives to, to one ear compared to the other. And also, you know, the changes in high frequencies can mean that you can actually determine if something is above you or below you, even though you're standing straight. And their, their um, Unity also comes built in with uh, Oculus Spatializer. But there's also other stuff that you can use. Uh, in level design, scale is extremely important. So, uh, I mean, working with VR is not so easy because you have to have the set headset. And if you have like three team members, who uses the headset? Now, you know, uh, like uh, we wrote uh, a couple of first person uh, scripts to be able to use it with mouse and keyboard, but it's just not the same because you, first of all, you don't see the, the stuff around you. You have a very narrow viewing angle. Uh, and also, uh, it's very difficult to kind of assess what kind of uh, sense of scale people will have for different things. Even the height of the ceiling is very important in, in VR. Um, one thing that, that um, somebody pointed out to me is disabilities. Like people, um, your game is going to be played by people who, who are using a wheelchair or are or, or, or not very tall or have trouble turning around. Like, yeah. If you, have a, if you have a wheelchair, it's very difficult, like te the teleportation me mechanic. When, when I teleport there and I want to turn around, if I have a wheelchair, it's very difficult to do that. So for, for uh, users that, that require that, it, it's great if you, can if you can use, for instance, the touchpad on the controller and be able to turn around like that. Mm. Uh, spend some time thinking about uh, storytelling in VR. And uh, it's not so easy. That's something that's completely non-standardized. A lot of people are attempting it. Uh, Oculus has a whole studio working on stories. Uh, but it's not, I mean, uh, this thing that I'm showing right here is something from, uh, that's a comparison between first person and third person games. Um, a lot of stud studies found that a third person game immerses you more in the story than a first person game oftentimes, which is counterintuitive. But why? Because you actually see the character and your brain fires uh, like mirror neurons when you see the emotion in that character. And that, that means through empathy, you feel the same emotion. If it's just you, you know, you, it's me, you know, in VR, in VR, I, I, the, the system cannot force me to feel something. The system, you know, cannot force me to look somewhere. If, if there's, a, there's a guy over there talking to me, I may not be interested, I can just go away. In a, in a, even in a first-person 3D game on a screen, the game can pause you, can, can pause uh, 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 get gameplay, start a cutscene, and then force me to, 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 to look through that cutscene, or at least know that a story development was done. But here, it, that's not possible. That would be like raping your entire experience in VR, you know, if the camera suddenly stopped. 
And there's a lot of challenge in that. And uh, we'll have to see what kind of experiences come up. Uh, I talked to some people who work on a, uh, on a puzzle game uh, with a heavy story in VR. And what they did, because you experience the story through the main character and the changes happening to the main character. Changes like they start off poor and they're rich. They start off, you know, not, not ready to do any uh, uh, exploring and adventuring, but then they, they go on the way and come back ch a changed person. But how do you do that? Uh, one, one, one example here would be actually not to do that to the main player, to the main character, but to have a, like a villain goes, undergoes changes. Or, or your companion under those changes. Uh, the benefit of having a companion or, or something that, or a narrator in a VR experience is also that it can draw your attention to something. Like you, you wake up in a dark room and then a light shines uh, in the sky and you look up and somebody beckons you to come there. Um, like as a, as a near future next uh, step thing, you know, you, we could already measure the heartbeat and EEG for, for the player. If you're working on a horror game, if the, if the heartbeat is not fast enough, you can just make it scarier. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I mean, this, that for me is a very, very scary thing, all it in, self, uh, it in, in itself, because um, going to such lengths to, to control what the player experiences can also be dangerous and we have to be uh, we have to take that into account uh, so just to wrap up here are some tips uh, general tips um, taken straight from Jesse Shell's uh, presentation Mo avoid motion sickness sickness uh, a lot of people still think that they will be motion sick uh, regardless which VR platform or game they use that's not true but a lot of people uh, are not doing themselves any favors by making unoptimized games or not having a low uh, um, like a, a low hardware le level uh, uh, not publicizing their, their minimum requirements well enough. So confusion is not okay in VR if you don't know where you are. Uh, shell object interactions which means like affordances if you, if you think you can pick up this glass and throw it and you can't that's, that kind of breaks your immersion. Uh, if it's too intense, it's it's not great. Uh, <laughs> and um, I also would, would would add like giving people the opportunity to pause in the game, not not just pause pause the game, but to, to just put stuff down and maybe have a breather. Um, and unrealistic audio, of course, if if the camera suddenly goes somewhere that my body isn't, that's going to be a problem. A um, couple of shout outs if you want to uh, try some things. Uh, can somebody recognize an Austrian game here? Yeah, yeah, it's a great game. Uh, wake up! Uh, I played uh, La Perry yesterday. Uh, a lot of this stuff is like ten or twenty euros in the uh, in the Steam store. <laughs> and, and for instance, Everest VR is thirty minutes long until you, and it's twenty euros or something like that. Uh, La Perry I finished yesterday is like thirty minutes long. And it's just an experience. You're there, you see it, uh, it's nice, but uh, uh, but it's, uh, I like to mention it anyway, because a lot of this stuff is breaking new ground in terms of uh, motion capture, in terms of uh, showing a dance performance in VR for, in this case. And I think it's, uh, we're at the point where, I mean, I buy everything, right? But because I want to see what people are making. But, uh, <laughs> We're at the point where we're going to start setting some standards and on the technical side, standards have already been made and, and uh, which is great. Uh, on the creative side, we'll have to see where uh, things go. Thank you.